Hey there friends, I'm Leo and today I have a lot of really exciting updates to show you guys. I think with this video we are just a couple of devlogs away from open playtest or open alpha. And just a quick heads up, I think you guys might notice that my voice is a little bit off in this video. Uh, I just recovered from a flu that really did a number on my throat and my voice is a little bit still recovering. So I hope you don't mind. I also got a new microphone so my voice is definitely going to sound a bit different than before regardless. Now there is finally stuff to do in the game, items to gather and houses to build. Of course it's all very prototypey and a work in progress but now I'm focusing a lot more on solid gameplay and a structure, as I was with the last video. I also started working on the SparkMuds wiki, where you will find information on everything related to the game. It's still a little bit bare bones but I'm gonna work hard on updating this when I'm not actively developing. Before talking about the building system though, I'll go over some of the major updates the game got recently that led up to this building mechanic. So the first thing that I've worked on was a rework on the crafting system. Yes, I know that I had the Minecraft grid style crafting, but in the end that would cause issues with the style of crafting I wanted to have in the game. For instance, I'd like to have multiple crafting stations to build specific item types. If all of them were a 6 style grid window, then that would cause a little bit of confusion as to what items were made where. And there is a reason why there's only one crafting table in Minecraft. Another thing that would be very hard to set up on this grid style crafting system is a way for the player to collect and learn recipes as they play the game. So picture you are in a dungeon and you open a treasure chest. There is a chance that the treasure chest is going to drop you the recipe to build a jetpack at an engineering crafting station. And the neat thing with this is that now the player holds a component called recipe bag and that is used to check what recipes you have and what you don't have at every crafting station. And this craft bag is also going to make it very very easy to save and load your recipes. So the way the system works is I have made a new object class called recipe. And this class has references for what items go into making this recipe and what item is generated from that. This information is then used on this crafting window and when you click to craft it, it is going to subtract the item cost from your inventory and add the generated item. And speaking of generated items, there are also some new tools and new assets in the game. Some of them are using the systems that you've seen already and some of them have new animations and some of them are completely new. Item durability is also a thing now. I had it mostly set up in the past using the unique ID setup, but now I have put that to work and it does work surprisingly well. You can also see your two strength and type. This is completely automatic and is going to track based on the item type. Apart from that, you will now see a base durability value on all of the unique items. This value is going to later be scaled based on the item quality. And remember, some unique items are destructible, but some of them are rechargeable. Rechargeable items like this drill here are not going to work when its charge is equal to zero, but they are able to be rechargeable if you put them on a recharging station, later to be implemented. Workstations in SparkMuds are going to be placeable objects that you can put on the floor and they're going to be categorized as two different things refining stations and crafting stations. Refining stations are going to be very diverse and they're going to be used to refine base materials that you just gathered into refined materials that you can use in crafting. The refining stations are generally going to consist of mini games that you will be able to play in order to refine your base items. The better you play and the longer your streak is, the bigger the rewards. The first refining station I've implemented is a wood cutting station. After gathering wood from the trees, you can press E on this refining station to get started on this minigame. First off, you can see this UI looks very raw and very ugly, and currently I'm focusing on functionality before making it pretty. And as a side note, that is why the crafting station and building UI are kind of ugly too. So the minigame consists of you waiting for your marker to enter the highlighted area, and when you click the mouse, it is going to execute a hit. If you have hit the target when your mark is inside of the highlighted area, it is going to break your log and you are going to exchange that log into a couple of blanks. 
If you miss, you are not going to receive any planks, but you are also not going to lose the log. The more consecutive hits you do, the quicker the minigame becomes and the more planks you will receive after each hit. If you play this game well enough, you can easily have double the normal amount of planks. This multiplier here is going to be used later when you are working as a woodcutter for NPCs. The better you play, the more currency you are going to earn. As for crafting stations, they are going to work in a similar manner, where each station is just going to show you a crafting window where you are going to be able to place items. This one is going to be the very first workstation that every player is going to be building in order to progress through the game. And after placing this workstation, all you gotta do is go near it and press E. This is going to change the camera position and show the crafting interface. And later on, I'm going to add custom animations and make it prettier and that's on my list. If you want to stop crafting, just press E again. One other thing that I've added that changed everything in the game is the overlay widget. So talking about interfaces here, normally you would only have the in-game HUD, right? Well, in Spark Muts, you do have the HUD, which is on the front layer. When starting a new game, I have functions that are going to swap the in-game HUD with any other custom HUDs that I might need. This is used for the build hammer, the woodcutting station and the basic workbench already. But what if I wanted information that never left the screen, even if I swap out the in-game HUDs? And I mean quality of life improvements like showing how many items you just received or lost. Or the thing you see on most AAA games where there's a little box on the corner that shows exactly every action you can perform at any given moment. That is why I have created the overlay HUD, which sits always on top of the in-game HUD. This overlay HUD contains the item notification bar that shows the items you just got, and also has a thing I have renamed to Item Info Box, which is a name I stole directly from the fandom wiki terminology. Anytime you need to hover over anything that has extra information for you, you can just create an info box which is just any type of widget and send that over to the overlay. Then it is going to automatically show and properly update the position of that info box. This is how I have two different types of detail widgets at different gameplay HUDs. I did not have to do that code twice. And this also helps a ton for a bug-free experience. You know, before the details of these items would just not spawn or they could have problems where one spawns on the top of the other and that was kind of a buggy mess sometimes. And now it is butter smooth and bug proof. One big thing that I changed now that was plaguing me a little bit in the past is the player input. Picture this with me. I had an action called player left click and another action called player right click. On these actions, you did not only have the clicks, but also the X key on the Xbox controller for the left click and a Y Xbox controller key for the right click. This was because at the time I was testing combat and I wanted those keys to play it on my controller. And then it came a time where I needed to implement the guns and the gunplay. In order to aim the gun, I was using right click and to shoot, I was using the left click. Did you notice the problem yet? The player actions were based on preset keys and not on the actions themselves. If I kept like that, I would be using X and Y to aim and shoot. How weird would that be? And now each action the player can ever make is going to be its own input key. And in that key, I will have specific keyboard and controller inputs. This does seem like a small change now, but it's going to make a very big difference later on when I'm implementing the game on consoles. And it's also a very good thing for you to think about your game as well if you are a developer. Think action-oriented inputs. Even if you have to make inputs that use the same keys, that is not a problem. Just think action-oriented inputs. And now it's time. Let's talk about the new building system and how it works. The building system all relies on one single component that is located on the building hammer. Using the previously made systems, it was pretty easy to just have the player holding the build hammer and the component to activate. This whole thing is a multi-step sort of system where each part uses stuff from one another. So it's kind of hard for me to entangle it and show it everything for you guys. So let's start with the beginning. Let's first talk about the building actor and the class that I've done. 
This here is a class that is necessary for all of the buildings and is what the building component spawns. This class is going to have information on the item costs, the item name, the item thumbnail, and the rotating thumbnail, and some snapping information. Another thing that I've created is an actor component called Building Snap Piece. This is inserted inside each actor at places where the building would connect to another building piece. Because of this enumeration that I've made, only snapping pieces of the same type are going to be joined together, otherwise they're going to be ignored. This here is used for the window holes and the door holes. When you select a building from the custom building HUD, it is going to set the class that you clicked on in your building component, and by holding the right click, you are going to start placing this building. Buildings cannot be placed in the air and they normally require to be snapped. You see the building highlighted in red if you cannot place it, either because the position is wrong or you don't have enough items to build it, and you are going to see the building highlighted in green if you are indeed able to place it and pay for the building cost. Then you can left click to place the building where you have selected. So when placing these buildings there are tons of different checks on bugs that I found like building pieces could be placed inside one another. To fix this I added a collision inside all of the building pieces that are going to not allow them to be placed if they are colliding. And of course, I needed to add a way to add multiple collisions, otherwise this window hole would never be possible, so I've done an array. Another problem was that windows and doors can be rotated and placed in very weird rotations. To fix that, I check if the door or window is parallel to the snapped actor. This requirement comes from any building that has this checked as true. Also, since we're talking about windows and doors, one check I had to make sure was present is if you destroy the window frame, you should also destroy the window. If you destroy the door frame, you should also destroy the door. Now, all of this is used for regular building parts, but for furniture, this treatment is a little bit different. And by furniture, I mean the workstations and the actual furniture, like chairs or tables. This is mostly how it works. For furniture, you won't have to worry about snap pieces, but the collision detection and the item rotation is much more precise. There are also checks to see if you're trying to place the object at an angle that exceeds what it can be placed at. And there you have it guys, these are most of the updates that I've worked on and I have a lot of stuff I still want to do in the coming two months. Hopefully if I finish all of it at the time frames that I'm estimating, then I will make the playtest completely open for everyone that wants to check it out. Then we're going to be entering open alpha. Also, Unreal Engine 5 just got released and I just bought an RTX 3080, so I am incredibly excited to check it out with SparkMods. Most of the plugins that I use have already been updated for that, I think I'm just waiting on the fur plugin, and then I'm all set to start migrating SparkMods over to Unreal Engine 5. I also want to do a retrospective video, just going back to the very beginning and talk about the project as a whole. I think it's been like almost two years since I started, so I think it's time. Thank you so much for watching, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more, and check out the Discord community for SparkMuts. There you can grab keys to the closed playtest and have a go at the systems I just talked about today. You guys have an awesome week, I'm Leo, signing out.